We all know the history of the Jews in Egypt in the Bible and that Joseph and Mary fled there to avoid the wrath of Herod. But there are so many other references to Africa in the Bible that most people do not know about. In fact, Africa is mentioned over 1,000 times in the Old Testament alone. How rarely do we acknowledge the unique promises God has bestowed upon the African people? African people, you may ask? In Psalm 68, 31, it is proclaimed that Cush shall extend its hands to God. The early church cherished this promise, interpreting Cush as a symbol of the Gentile bride of Christ. The Psalms foresaw a time when individuals would recognize the spiritual depth of the Cushites and proclaim their rebirth in Zion. Check out Psalms 87 verses 3 to 6. Isaiah prophesied that God would raise a remnant from Cush and a redeemed people who would bring gifts to Zion. Zephaniah also declared that from the distant lands of Cush, God's people would offer their gifts. Amos then conveyed God's care for Cush with the words, Are you not as the Cushites to me, O people of Israel? says the Lord. We could go on and on about Cush, but where is Cush and who are the Cushites? Biblical scholars are cognizant of the fact that Cush can have various meanings, at times referring to the entirety of Africa, excluding Egypt and occasionally signifying ancient Nubia, an area extending from present-day Aswan in the north to Khartoum in the south, with much of it located in Sudan today. Some versions of the Bible translate Cush as Ethiopia, but this doesn't correspond to the modern country of Ethiopia. Hence, it is somewhat of a consensus that the area of Cush is where we call Sudan today in Africa. In the book of Genesis in the post-flood era, Noah's family was tasked with repopulating the earth. Ham, Noah's youngest son, had four sons of his own, and three of them settled in Africa. Mitzrayim settled in Egypt, Put settled near Libya, and Cush settled in a region south of Egypt which came to be named after him. Most scholars identify Cush as the area of modern Sudan. Africa in the Old Testament. Number one, the river from the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden was described in Genesis as having a four river system that flowed through the region of the lands of Cush, Havilah and Asher, which today would be near the borders of Eastern Sudan, Ethiopia and Eritrea. Genesis 2 verse 10 to 13 reads, A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is the Pishon. It winds through the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. Aromatic resin and onyx are also there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It winds through the entire land of Cush. These valuable resources were primarily associated with the geographical area we now identify as Sudan in ancient times. The birthplace of humanity was confirmed when the oldest human remains were found in Ethiopia in 1974. Science has often been at odds with the Bible, but one thing both confirm is that the birthplace of humanity was in East Africa. Number 2. God's Chosen Prophet the book of Zephaniah commences with the statement, The message from the Lord that was revealed to Zephaniah, the son of Cushi, the son of Gedaliah, the son of Amariah, the son of Hezekiah, during the reign of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. Zephaniah 1.1 Zephaniah belonged to the Davidic royal lineage, with his great-great-grandfather being King Hezekiah. Furthermore, Zephaniah's father was identified as Cushi, suggesting that this prophet had a biracial background. Zephaniah's grandmother, who was married into the Jewish royal line through Gedaliah, was of African descent. It is likely that she named her son Cushi to celebrate and honor his ethnic heritage from Cush. As a biracial prophet, Zephaniah symbolized the hope of a diverse people of God, fulfilling the promises of God to Abraham regarding his blessing reaching the nations. Crucial to our comprehension of Zephaniah's prophecy is the fact that Nimrod, 
the son of Cush from the story of Ham and Noah's sons, was responsible for constructing the ancient Tower of Babylon. It was in Babylon that God intervened, confronting those who sought to elevate their own name. This divine intervention resulted in the confusion of languages and the dispersal of people across the world, as detailed in Genesis chapters 10 and 11. The descendants of Cush migrated to the northeastern horn of Africa. They were among the various families and nations to whom God promised blessings, ultimately through Abraham's messianic descendants. Number three, Hagar, the Egyptian slave. Hagar, the maid of Sarah and Abraham who bore Abraham a son, Ishmael is said to have origins from the south of Egypt. Genesis 16 verse one reads, now Sarah, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abraham, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go, sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Number four, Moses' Cushite wife. The book of Numbers tells us Moses was criticized by his older siblings for having married a Cushite woman. Numbers 12 verse 1 reads, Miriam and Aaron began to talk against Moses because of his Cushite wife, for he had married a Cushite. Interestingly, Miriam, who held ill feelings toward her black sister-in-law and resented her, underwent a transformation, turning white due to leprosy until she changed her ways. If this Cushite wife is indeed Zipporah, whom we already know is Moses' wife from the Bible, it would mean that Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, the priest responsible for establishing the legal, administrative, and sacrificial frameworks within Israel, and the man that offered refuge to Moses during his 40-year tenure as a shepherd in the Sinai region, was Cushite as well. Number five, Africans in Canaan. As the Israelites established themselves in the land of Canaan, African individuals were part of their community. Some may have left Egypt alongside the Israelites during the Exodus, as mentioned in Exodus 12, verse 38, while others arrived with military forces, as indicated in passages in 1 Kings 14, 2 Chronicles chapters 12, 14, and 16. It seems that an Ethiopian settlement was established in Gerar to act as a protective zone between Egypt and Judah. Consequently, the Ethiopian population became long-term inhabitants of Canaan, residing there until the era of Hezekiah. We read, They journeyed to the entrance of Gedor, to the east side of the valley, to seek pasture for their flocks, where they found rich, good pasture, and the land was very broad, quiet, and peaceful. For the former inhabitants there belonged to Ham, 1 Chronicles 4, verse 39-40. Furthermore, a group of Philistines and Arabs were said to be settled near the Ethiopians in 2 Chronicles 21, verse 16. Number six, King Solomon's Brides. The bride in Song of Solomon is black and beautiful as said in Song of Solomon 1, verse five and six, which read, I am dark but lovely, like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon. Do not look upon me because I am dark, because the sun has tanned me. African individuals continued to hold a significant place in royal circles, exemplified by Solomon's marriage to an Egyptian princess, as documented in 1 Kings 9, verse 16 and 24, as well as 2 Chronicles 8, verse 11. Furthermore, Solomon received a visit from the Queen of Sheba, as recounted in 1 Kings and 2 Chronicles. This influential queen governed dark-skinned populations on both sides of the Red Sea, and her initial encounter with Solomon likely revolved around negotiating a trade treaty, given his expanding maritime influence. Despite testing him with challenging questions, she eventually confided in him openly, suggesting that Solomon found in this black woman a kindred spirit with whom he could engage in meaningful discourse. Number seven, Cushite pharaohs. During the reign of Cushite pharaohs in Egypt, they formed military alliances with both Israel and Judah, particularly during the era of the 25th or Cushite dynasty. Sabacho, 
also known as So in 2 Kings 17 verse 4, established a partnership with Hoshea, the king of Israel, to counter Assyrian influence. Likewise, Tirhaka, who ruled from 690 to 664 BC, came to Hezekiah's aid when Jerusalem was under siege, as mentioned in 2 Kings 19 verse 9 and Isaiah 37 verse 9. Notably, mortuary figurines of Tirhaka vividly depict his African features, and his colossal statue still stands tall within the Grand Temple Complex at Karnak. Number 8. Cushites and Prophecy The Cushites frequently feature in prophetic messages, encompassing both punishment and restoration. In terms of retribution, God revealed His plan to allow Assyria to conquer Egypt and Cush, a development that would cause distress and humiliation among the people in Judah, who had placed their hopes in Cush and boasted about Egypt as mentioned in Isaiah 20 verse 5. Similarly, echoing the sentiments found in Zephaniah, Ezekiel proclaimed, The day of the Lord is near and foretold. A sword will come upon Egypt, and anguish will befall Cush in Ezekiel 30 verse 3 to 4. However, in terms of restoration, Isaiah prophesied that a remnant from Cush would also play a role in the remarkable new exodus that God would orchestrate during the Messiah's era. Isaiah 11 verse 11 to 12 reads, In that day, the Lord will extend His hand yet a second time to recover the remnant that remains of His people, from Assyria, from Egypt, from Pathros, from Cush, from Elam, from Shinar, from Hamath, and from the coastlands of the sea. He will raise a signal for the nations and will assemble the banished of Israel and gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Back to Zephaniah in chapter 2 verse 12, God declared punishment on Cush. After that, in Zephaniah 3 verse 9 to 10, Zephaniah predicts that even the most distant lands upon which God has poured His wrath will have a worshiping remnant whom His presence will compel to the transformed Jerusalem, thus reversing the curse of Babel. The prophet elevates the region of Cush as an example of God's end-time new creational transformation. Africa in the New Testament, the Ethiopian treasurer. The influence of the Cushite kingdom persists in the New Testament, as evidenced by the account of the Ethiopian treasurer's conversion under Candace's rule in the book of Acts 8, verse 26, 39. Candace held the royal title of the Queen Mother of Nubia, a formidable African nation primarily situated in present-day Sudan. Greek was the language spoken at the royal court, allowing the treasurer to read a Septuagint version of the prophet Isaiah without difficulty. Philip, being a Greek-speaking Jew, could effectively communicate the gospel to him. In saving the Ethiopian treasurer, the Lord began reversing the destructive effects of the Tower of Babel and inaugurated a global ingathering that will culminate in omni-ethnic praise to Jesus at the end of the age. The first known Gentile convert to Christianity was a Cushite, and this highlights that God was beginning to fulfill the shaping of his multi-ethnic community of worshipers, just as Zephaniah proclaimed. The man who helped Jesus carry his cross. Simon of Cyrene was the man compelled by the Romans to help carry the cross of Jesus of Nazareth as Jesus was taken to his crucifixion, according to all three Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Each of these books say he was of Cyrene. Cyrene was a Greek colony in Libya. 3. Cyrene Despite the initial objections of an African synagogue in Cyrene to Stephen's preaching as mentioned in Acts 6 verse 9, it's noteworthy that other Cyrenians soon embraced Christianity and shared the gospel's message with Cyprus as depicted in Acts 11 verse 19 to 26. These Cyrenians and Cyprians later journeyed to Antioch, introducing a new approach to spreading the gospel among non-Jewish Greeks. This groundbreaking action drew the attention of the Jerusalem Council, prompting them to send Barnabas to assess this emerging development. Convinced of the authenticity of this mission, 
Barnabas collaborated with other leaders and went to Tarsus to find Paul. Realizing that achieving the goals set by these African believers required a diverse and multicultural task force, the church in Antioch engaged in a year of prayer, scriptural study, and strategic planning. During this time, a core group of leaders emerged, among whom were two Africans, Lucius of Cyrene and Simon, who was referred to as the Black in Acts 13, 1 to 2. It is important to note that the term used in most translations in Latin means black, suggesting that Simon of Cyrene might be the individual referred to. This missionary agency was in large part initiated, strategized, promoted, and directed by Africans. A significant portion of early church history, along with the influential Christian theologians of that era, has its roots in Africa, notably, Cyprian and Tertullian hailed from Carthage, which is located in present-day Tunisia. Likewise, prominent figures like Clement, Origen, Athanasius, and Cyril all originated from Alexandria, Egypt. St. Augustine of Hippo was born in a region that is now part of Algeria. An interesting historical tidbit is that Three of the early popes, namely Victor I, Melchides Meltiades, and Galatius I, were of African descent. While early Christianity dwindled in North Africa, there is a rich tradition of Coptic Christianity in Egypt and Sudan, as well as Orthodox Christianity in Ethiopia, which predates the arrival of Western missionaries. The growth of these churches was fostered by local evangelists, helpers and translators who lived out their faith, serving as examples to attract others. Today, a majority of Africans residing south of the Sahara are followers of Christianity. Projections suggest that Africa will be home to approximately 760 million Christians by the year 2025. 